I want to talk today about wellness in ministry. Um, about 1995, uh, when I was still in the Navy, uh, I had an opportunity to do um, some really cool things. I was working at an addictions uh, rehabilitation center in Florida, and they sent us to Stephen Covey's um, humongous ranch place in Dallas, and I was certified as a wellness coach. And uh, I practiced a little bit off and on uh, in that regard for a number of years until I went through seminary and became a pastor and started serving churches. And then that just kind of went by the wayside. Well, then about a year ago, through the Center for Progressive Renewal, they offered a course uh, in uh, beginning coaching uh, for ministers. And it was through an organization called Coaching for Clergy. And I thought, well, I'll just try it. I don't really think I want to go back into this, but I'll just try it. And it took about two class sessions for me to be totally hooked again on, on coaching, particularly wellness coaching, and particularly because of that experience working with clergy. Now, the Methodists have, they've got this down pat, let me tell you. They're doing great things in the Methodist uh, tradition in terms of paying attention to uh, the wellness of their clergy and, um, and all of their ministers, basically. Um, and they're very much like us. Uh, you're a member of a church, you're active, you're a minister. Whether we, we take that on when we become a part of our faith traditions. So, I've been reading an awful lot and doing an awful lot. And by the way, this is very interactive and you can stop me and make a comment or ask a question or anything at any point. Um, because I would really like to hear what you think. And then we're going to do... I'm recording, so if anybody says something they don't want recorded, just let me know and I can hit pause. Okay, good. Is Sorry, I just that? wanted to let people know that. Okay. So if you're going to say something about Ken, let me know. Then I'll be keeping running. <laughs> so, all right. I put this question or this statement up here because of an article that I have a copy of for each of you, which I'll share at the end of the, uh, the workshop. Um, the article starts with this comment. Being a pastor or a minister, that's my word, is bad for your health. And then I put a question mark on there because some people may not buy that, but many, many studies that have been done and are in progress are actually showing that. And I'd like to read the first paragraph of this article just to get you excited about it so that you'll actually take one of these and read it later. Being a pastor is bad for your health. Pastors have little time for exercise. They often eat meals in their car or at potluck dinners, not known for their fresh green salads. <laughs> the demands on their time are unpredictable and never ending, and their days involve an enormous amount of emotional investment and energy. Well, so far, pretty much right on. Family time is often intruded upon. Hmm? Never. When a pastor announces a vacation, the congregation frowns. <laughs> Pastors yes. tend to move frequently too frequently to maintain relationships with doctors and others who might hold them accountable for their health. The profession discourages by the movement them making really close friends. All of this translates, studies show, and there are innumerable studies and more and more coming out, into clergy having higher than normal rates of obesity, arthritis, depression, heart problems, high blood pressure, diabetes, and stress. Everybody want an article? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's good. So that got me thinking. Okay, surely, well, let me, let me go back. You've all heard the, the statement that a budget is a moral document. Is, is that, mm -hmm. y'all heard that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I heard another one, and it's called, it says um, a calendar is a moral document. Uh -huh. mm, that's an interesting twist, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Why do we spend our time doing, why do we spend our time doing it, and what effect 
does it have on us when we do that? And are we actually, by virtue of being called as ministers to serve others, again, ministers in the broadest term, are we not also called to take care of ourselves? You know? So I tend to believe that a calendar is a moral document. And I'll tell you why. I have a number of pieces of scripture, little things that I've handed out. And I'm wondering if whoever's closest to them would just grab it. I mean, we're a friendly group. And we're going to read those. And I, I, whoever has Matthew 22, could you read Matthew 22 loud and strong, please? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. What I hear in that is if I'm going to love you, I need to love myself first. And if I'm loving you like I'm loving myself, and I'm not doing a very good job of loving myself, what's that mean I'm giving you? Hmm. Something to think about. How about Mark? Who's got Mark? Mark 6. Please. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Mm. Good lessons, and we've all heard that, and probably a number of us have talked about that. How about uh, Paul's interpretation of what Jesus shared? Who has Ephesians 5? Gail. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Mm, that puts a real interesting perspective on it, doesn't it? We are a part of Christ's body. So do we not have that moral, that spiritual, that whatever uh, obligation to care for ourselves? So that we can be better ministers. And 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom among whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Did everybody hear that? Honor God with your body. That's pretty direct, pretty, pretty sound guidance there. And then I've been captured by a particular one. And I actually, before I was called to my um, latest ministerial assignment, which is in Kirkland as their interim, I was rolling pretty good at, at standing up a practice uh, known as, as I call it, Bushel Basket Ministries. And I'll tell you why. Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Bushel basket ministry. This is how this came about. I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, okay, here's my bushel basket, this is my mini basket, not my big basket, my mini basket. And I thought, well, you know, if my light is underneath there, and nobody can see it, it does no good. And to me, metaphorically, this basket is so many of the things that we put on ourselves in this life. It can be poor eating. It can be lack of movement. It can be struggling financially. It can be anything that we cover ourselves up with, metaphorically, is this basket. And if we decide to deal with those things and gradually remove them from our lives, lo and behold, <laughs> our light shines. And then, this is how I've been thinking about it, what can we put in the basket so that our light can actually lift 
and be seen by all. What can we put in here? Share with me. What, what good can we put in here that allows our light to shine more fully? A but strong family foundation? Strong family. If I get to the gym, I'll be strong enough to lift it up. Hey, there you go. <laughs> get into the gym. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> good nutrition. Come on, throw them out. Enough sleep. Enough sleep. Vacation. Vacation. I'll be Play. 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 Sabbath. Thank you. Sabbath. Yep. Boundaries. So, boundaries. Friends. People who nourish us. Uh, living in a good place, a safe place. All sorts of things are good things that we can put in to our bushel. Best. Time with our animals. Playing with animals. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that it's not just because all the pundits said, hey, take care of yourself. Uh, and wellness is so much more than working out and eating right. I think we all know that now. Years ago, it was, hey, uh, go on a diet, eat good food, exercise, and you'll be well. And we know that there's so much more to that now. When I was first working in this field, I came up with, ta-da! Anne's own propeller theory. You know, I have a Navy background and it happens to be in aviation. So, so I got to thinking. Oh, I re pardon? A bi-wing too. Yeah. Well, it was the only one Donna found it, which I'm so grateful for. But it actually turned out. When I was young in the Navy, I was in a squadron. And a number of our planes were propeller driven. And I noticed that one thing the pilots always did when they went out to the plane to, to go for a flight is they would go, and they would look over the body of the aircraft for sure, but then they would go to the propeller. And they would run their hands on the blades of the propeller. And if they couldn't reach them, they'd put a ladder there, and they'd explore those blades of that propeller. Why? Here's why. Because the propeller is actually what literally propels the plane forward, right? Easy enough. If you sustain a ding in one of your blades, a ding, now well, it's not gonna be that big of a deal as long as you find it and you take care of it and you smooth it out. But if you let it go, or if you sustain a, a bunch of bunch more dings, sooner or later, you're gonna start getting a little bit of vibration in the propeller and in the plane as you're flying. The more you um, fail, I guess that's probably not a good way to say it, but the longer you fail to tend to the dings in the propeller, the more vibration, the harder it is for your plane to fly, and so forth. So I see this, again, metaphorically, as our bodies. We have certain aspects of our lives, and I'm here I put six. And you can come up with your own. This is not rock, uh, rocket science, and it's not locked in stone. And there are about 200 or more variations of the way people break down the dimensions of our whole body health. And these I'm, I'm using because I use it later in, in something we're going to practice with. But here we have a spiritual dimension of our lives, social, emotional, intellectual, financial, and physical. So let's say that um, something has happened to you financially and it's really had a, a, an effect on your life. That is a big ding. And without tending to that, you're going to get a life vibration there that actually starts to impact, well, I can't go to the gym because I can't afford it. I can't go out with friends because money's tight. I can't do, I can't go buy the book that I want, or I can't take that class. So things in different aspects, dimensions of our lives, affect not just that dimension, but the whole thing. In the same way that a ding in a single propeller on an aircraft, the, the vibration of it that it causes affects the entire aircraft. And the effectiveness of that aircraft to fly forward through the air and do the job, right? To me, that makes such a good sense. So, our goal is to maximize the efficiency of 
ourselves, of our bodies, of everything that make us who we are. Don't you like Anne's own propeller? It's awesome. So, we sustain dings, or we have dings, or there are elements, or there's junk on us that's covering up our lives, our, our light shining. What do we do about it? How do we create change that will allow our light, our light to shine a little more? Can you see that, Medora? I'm hoping everybody can see this. Okay. The bottom line is, we get into ruts every now and then, and we all know that. So I'm going to share uh, an autobiography in five short chapters that I think illustrates how we, we tend to take dings and we say, oh, I'll just deal with it, I'll deal with it later. And then they get, big, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they become an impediment, and then we keep trying to find ways around the impediment, and we're just not dealing with the stuff that we need to deal with. Autobiography in five short chapters. One, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. <laughs> my eyes are open and I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in that sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five. I walk down another street. <laughs> I have copies of this for everybody. If you would like that. Did you write that? <laughs> but I was pretty happy when I found it. Uh, that'll preach, so. That'll preach. It sure will. <laughs> okay, so there are so many theories, change theories, and, and whatever. This one works for me. Awareness of what's going on, plus intention to change it, plus action to make it change, equals real and lasting change. Pretty common sense stuff. I mean, you can get really scientific about it and go to Prochaska, a fellow by the name of Prochaska and his PhD work, wrote about the five or six uh, stages of change and all of that good stuff, and I use that as well. But uh, this one works, and I've actually used this with clients, and they go, oh, wow, where have I been? Of course, you know, I can think about it all I want. I can have the best of intentions, but if I really don't do anything, don't, what's that, what's that? We, we heard something the other day. Knowledge without doing, without doing is the same as not knowing, is the same as not having the knowledge. Yeah. Knowing without doing is the same as not knowing. Okay, so there we go. All right, so how in the world do we increase our awareness, increase our intention, increase our action, and get real change in our lives in terms of improving the dimensions of our lives, our wellness? This is the model that I'm licensed in. This is the one that I use as a coach. It happens to be a little bit expensive, saying I wasn't able to pay the $40 per program for everybody in here so that we could play with this today. But I just wanted to show it to you. Again, there are so many, there's a couple hundred different theories out there and programs that coaches and counselors can use. But this is one, it has 12 different dimensions. They break it down pretty, and, and they talk about self-responsibility, breathing, sensing, eating, moving, feeling, thinking, playing and working, communicating, intimacy, finding meaning, transcending. 
Now you can imagine, and most ministers score pretty highly here. You should have seen my wheel the first time I took it. My eating and moving were pretty close in. And the whole theory behind this, and when you take this program, you go in and you start with self-responsibility and love. They ask you 10 to 12 questions about your life. And based on where you are with it, your color goes out a certain ways. Mm -hmm. See? So once you've completed the whole thing, and let's say transcending and finding meaning are way out here, and communicating may be way out here, and thinking may be way out here, but moving might be here, and eating might be here, and breathing might be here, in my case. And um, can you imagine love. Yeah. <laughs> how that wheel would work? How, what kind of a ride would you get with a wheel like that? Pretty lopsided. So the whole goal of a program like this is, and the second question they ask you, where are you? Do you think you're really great on self-responsibility and love? Or are you really struggling? And, how, and then the second question is, how motivated are you to improve? This? And that's what coaches like myself use this information for. Because if I find somebody that's really low here, but their motivation to improve is way out here, we start work. You know, we start working on it. So this is an, a really incredible tool. It's the one, again, that I use. Uh, I love it. Um, but the Lutherans also have joined in to this, and they're starting to work with their ministers, and they have a program that's free. So I wanted to share that with you today. Mm. And that's this one. Don't panic. Don't <laughs> panic. It's really it easy. It's I know. It's really <laughs> easy. So we're going to pass these out. I'll give everybody a copy. And, and I'll show you what to do with it. Because then I'm going to ask you to play with it. Okay? So very similar to the wellness inventory that I showed you before. Each of these, and these are the six, by the way, that I used for my propeller theory earlier. And again, so busy with you. If you were to do something like this for yourself, you could break your wheel down any way you wanted to. You could have 12 dimensions or seven dimensions or whatever. But a program like this, in the physical area, you see it's marked one, two, three, four, five, six. In a minute, I'm gonna hand out another piece of paper. And what they do is they ask you six questions. For instance, the first question, right here, Physical one, I eat a balanced nutritional diet. If you think you're just doing a super job of that, take your pencil and give yourself a super score. If you think, well, I'm about half the time I do, half the time I don't, there's your 50%. If you think, man, I could really use some work here, gotta stop eating in the car. <laughs> then you give yourself a mark down here, okay? My suggestion is, and the reason that there are pencils and crayons is because I thought if you could use a pencil to kind of give yourself a mark as you go through the questions, and then you go back and review your section when you're done and say, am I happy with these? Yeah, I am. And then you take a crayon and mark and color in, color in your up to the mark that you put for yourself. What you're going to do is you're going to build your wheel. Yeah. And you're going to be able to see, oh my, I'm doing really well in the physical. I'm doing really well in financial. Oh man, I haven't done much. I haven't read a good book lately. I haven't taken a class. I haven't, you know, I haven't been a part of a book group or whatever the questions are. I don't think I'm hitting them on the head. But, um, and you'll see how well your life wheel is functioning. Are you, are you on a bumpy ride? Is there something you're not paying attention to that might be worth that? So we're gonna take a couple minutes. Is everyone clear on that, mm -hmm. on how to do it? It's pretty simple. So I'll ask you to individually take a look at these, mark your wheel, color it in, play with it, and then we'll move forward. The most current 
research and studies and, and such, and certainly something that, that I uh, believe in and have experience in my coaching and actually in ministry, is encouraging people to very intentionally to create awareness, to walk forward intentionally, to take action, but to do it in small steps. Yeah. If you go into something and you say, ha, I'm going to be a marathoner next weekend, <laughs> guess how successful you're going to be? <laughs> yes. Either that or you're going to be really, the really, lilacs. really, really, really <laughs> sore. Yeah. 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 Blue, blue, blue yeah. Tuesday yeah. is next week. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, right. There will be so people right. named marathoners next week. There's been a lot of research, and, and one fellow uh, has written extensively on what he calls um, the Kaizen, Kaizen steps. And what that is about, Robert Maurer uh, wrote, one small step can change your life, the Kaizen way. One small step can change your life, the Kaizen way. What Kaizen is about and what research has shown is that our brains are hardwired to resist change. It's our way of, of uh, protecting ourselves, I suppose. Um, it's, it's like, our brain is like a sleeping lion, you know? And and if we if we step on the tail, and we take a great big step, and we stomp on the tail of that lion, our brain is the amygdala, amygdala? Yeah. is yeah. the right way of saying it, actually has a fear response to change. And it's like wakening that lion, and we get this roar, this huge resistance, to change, mm -hmm. and guess what? It, it peters yeah. out. Yeah. You don't you don't change because your your brain is just working against you. So it's like feed your brain like that sleeping lion and take small steps and sneak up on it or <laughs> to go around it. Oh, on you know? church committees. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> There's just the yeah. cutest. Um, cartoon and I, and I should have made copies for you all but there's a fellow sitting in his recliner and and um, uh, maybe that's his wife standing there talking to him and he says my doctor told me to start my exercise program very gradually yeah. today I drove past a store that sells sweatpants <laughs> <laughs> but honestly when I, I did a workshop on this uh, about a year ago actually and they said that actually works you know if you're contemplating you and if you drive store. by big five <laughs> And you think, oh, I need to buy some new workout shoes. So get in the car, drive by it, and think, well, tomorrow I might stop in. And the next time I buy it. And then eventually you do stop and you start looking. And then eventually you buy. You know, maybe that's an exaggeration. <laughs> but small steps. So as you're contemplating your action plan, which I'm going to give you, keep Kaizen steps in mind. Is okay? My, what is Kaizen? Is there an actual Japanese term? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know the origin of it, but uh, Maurer probably says that in It's what Google's for. Book. The other thing I wanted to talk briefly about is, you know, one of the many programs that I've been through in my, in my working life um, was Covey's Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. And I did this uh, in the mid-90s, and it really did have a profound effect on me. In, in a very simple way. When you, when you go to a workshop with Stephen Covey, he puts two big glass cylinders out on the table. And he has a pile of big rocks, and he has a pile of medium-sized rocks, mm -hmm. and he has a container of sand. And he has somebody come up and fill it. 99% of the time, they'll go to the sand, and they'll pour the sand in, they'll put the little rocks in, and then they'll try to squeeze those big rocks into the cylinder, and guess what? It doesn't work. No. Okay, and then you'll bring somebody else up, and they'll say, do this. Take the big rocks, put the big rocks in. And those big rocks, metaphorically, are the big things in our lives, the most important things. And we all have roles. We have, we're moms, dads. Um, we work. We're pastors. We're lay people. We're the moderators of churches. We're Partners. all these things. Pardon? Partners. Partners. What are your big rocks? What are the most important things to you in your life? Make sure you get those on your moral calendar first. Mm -hmm. Then go to the medium size and put that in. Then imagine this, you pour the sand in, every single bit of it goes in. I have seen this work. It's amazing. 
So keep that in mind. As you're thinking about the changes in your life, what's important to you? Are you just picking something out of the air because it's on here, or is it, is it important to you? Is it a big rock? What on there that you might think about changing is your big rock? And then take your Kaizen steps to get to it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass out. It's called your plan, and I, and I, I just want to tell you, you can't leave until you get this whole thing completed and you have it checked <laughs> off by me. <laughs> Not true. Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't sound like it. However, I'll be bad. Are, are you an A plus? Would you do that? If I told you? No. I yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact. But do take it and, and do give consideration to your wheel. And if there are things in your life that are big rocks and the question wasn't asked, ask the question and fit it into your wheel. This thing is supposed to be usable by you and meaningful for you. These are questions somebody else came up with. Put in your own. Take your time with this. At the bottom, it talks about, I will, my first step will be, I will share my plans with, and ask support by saying, I will review my progress on. Accountability is one of the biggest, most effective ways of actually creating change. If you have a buddy that you're walking this road with, a partner, a good friend, a colleague, whatever. It's more apt to happen. So give this some thought. Take one, see, see what you can come up with from that beautiful little wheel you all have. What are your places that you can take Kaizen steps on your big rocks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good Okay, Donna just helped me out. Kai, Kaizen is a Japanese word. Kai means change. Zen means good. So we're talking about... Good change. Good change. Thank you, Google. <laughs> Thank you, free Wi-Fi. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, you said the Lutheran Seminary Institute was offering this for free. Is it, can you find out more about that through at the bottom, yeah. Of, yeah, it's there. So I would Google it, yeah, or contact them. Yeah, that's. I well, appreciate that. the whole aspect. It's really wonderful knowing there's stuff already out there that's. Yeah. I, I think as long as you attribute it to the copyright, and it is yeah. copyrighted, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it's um, there's so much on the internet, and. A lot of it's very protected, and you can't yeah. copy it, you can't do anything, yeah. and they freely give it, so yeah, that was pretty wonderful. cool. I was looking for something specifically to use in here. Um, so. That was my question. Okay. Is there a website for this? But yeah, I, I would go I on and I would go more the services website would probably uh -huh. have it, since they're kind of the overall mm -hmm. of the ELC. You can go on and you can Google wellness wheels, yeah. and you'll get a yeah. bunch of Yeah, them. yeah. probably ELC. I, I did some uh, self-care through Seattle University and their pastoral leadership program. Uh -huh. It's a wonderful place that spends a whole year, well, September through May, uh, not doing necessarily this coaching stuff, but stuff addressing. I mean, I found that a lot of the areas are balanced and filled out because of my year in pastoral mm -hmm. leadership program. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, and it's not just for pastors. There's, there are some lay leaders that take that class also. Uh, I'm actually giving some thought to that. So, um, but if you want to talk more. So, oh, if, if, yeah. if you decide to sign up, you think about it, just say Ken Coleman told you about it, and that helps me and with you'll some. Get a commission? No, I get bookstore money. So. <laughs> but you can help him with his wheel. Yeah. So, that's good. So. That would be cool. Well, I mean, yeah, it would be. Also thinking about uh, talking with Pat Berger and seeing if I can get her. One thing I'm, I, I have copies of the article, Fit for Ministry here. I've got copies of the uh, five short chapters, if you'd like a copy of that. I have um, something else I want to share with you. I've got some extra copies, too, of the, um, of the wheel and the paperwork that goes with it, if you want to take it, share it with your family, whatever. Talking about Covey, 
and a calendar being a moral document, um, you know, for a fair amount of money, you can actually buy a Cubby Franklin because he merged with them. Um, one of the um, books that you, you know, calendar, yeah, planners. And but one of the most cool things about his program is um, he strongly recommended to people that on a Sunday evening or whenever, that you sat down and you looked at your calendar for the coming week and you planned it out and you used one of these um, weekly compasses. And on these compasses, um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe, um, different places where you put the role that you are. Like my role would be mom, um, pastor, um, colleague, um, aunt, whatever. You're my, what I think my roles are in life. And I would put them in there. And then it asks you, what are your goals for the week in that regard? You put your big rocks on here and then you put your goals, and then you put them on your calendar. Hmm. That's a pretty cool idea. And he talks a lot about it in this the Seven Habits book. When I'm not trying to market his book, trust me, um, you can find him real cheap in used bookstores now. Good but one. if you would like one of these to play with, you know, feel free. Create your own. The whole point here is to figure out a way of assessing uh, your propeller blades your, the things that move you through life on a, on a consistent basis, analyze it, figure out where you want, uh, create your awareness, create your intention, create your action, and then that will create your change to give you a healthier, happier, more productive life, as I always put it. Yes, ma'am. You know, when I look at this, one of the areas that's the most open, you know, the least color, is in the area of conflict resolution. Mm. And I don't want to pass the clock on the other person or the other group. Mm -hmm. But that's a really difficult area. Mm -hmm. I can decide to change. Mm. But what if the other person or the other group doesn't decide to change? I can't plan to get together with that other element, mm -hmm. unless that other element puts me on the calendar too. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. there are some hitches in this system that mm -hmm. that are very dependent upon pulling in an outside person, the interaction to with help other people, be mm -hmm. conflict resolution person, mm -hmm. sure, or um, to be an intermediary mm -hmm. or a reconciliation. There's a lot of wiggle so room. It's there, yeah, there's, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's an awful lot of complication. Well, and so it, and I, it, I don't like to oversimplify, I guess, yeah. you know, some of the mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. I think each of us individually have to look at it and, and sculpt it to our own lives. Yeah. You know, what is the reality of my life? Does this fit or doesn't it? These, all of these programs are things that people have put together, many of them to sell, many of them to market, sure. but most of them with some degree of good intention to help people improve. And that's why I always caveat this with, make it your own. Right. You know? mm -hmm. right. And if a question doesn't fit, Strike the question. Yeah. What helps and what Write in another help. question that is more appropriate to you. Was there a question over here? Well, I was just saying with the conflict resolution, sometimes conflict resolution is more about you have to let go of the other person and resolve within yourself that Right. That has to happen first. Yeah. yeah. And well no, but to say I can't resolve yeah. this conflict, so I'm gonna let it go in myself and not worry about it anymore. Right. All right. I guess so, I will leave you because it is time. We have a couple things that we want um, to hand out to you as a as a remembrance of what we talked about here today, the propeller theory and such. So um, I know Donna will help me, and everybody gets to take one. And you can do this with your. It's a little airplane. So remember, remember you're going to work on your propeller.
Oh, I don't. I didn't bring my work. Uh, my uh, other work cards. Uh, these are my church cards. But if you want to get a hold of me, I'd be glad to talk with you. Um, I'd be glad to chat with anybody in your congregation. Oh yeah. Cool. You got them way too excited about the airplane. I know. I'm excited about the airplane. Oh no, they are fun. Are you kidding? Remember our call as ministers in our faith to take care of ourselves so that we can take better care of others. Amen. Robert Taylor, who writes often, uh, minister, priest in the, in the Episcopalian tradition, wrote this week, when I light a candle to the darkness, I say no to the darkness and claim the light. Amen. It's our responsibility to claim the light, my friends. Go in peace.